Hi, everyone, and welcome to week six. Where we're going to start talking about data screening. Data screening is broken up into two weeks because it's kind of a long section. So in this video, we'll cover the first half. And in the next week, for the next set of videos, we'll cover the second half. So let's get started. Data screening is this principle, this idea that we have the data, but garbage in, garbage out. So if our data set includes inaccurate values or somehow um, data that is incorrect, the analysis that we would perform on that data would also be useless. So data screening is a key facet of any analysis. And sort of under data screening is also data cleanup. So formatting it in the right format, fixing all those factors like we did last week for ggplot. And I would say out of analyses, this is what you probably spend the most time doing. It's kind of counterintuitive. You think the statistics are the hard part, but in reality, the data cleanup is the more difficult component. And so data that's incorrect produces um, useless output, right? Data that's incomplete provides incomplete output. So we've seen this a lot with our understanding of COVID and the uh, differential different data types that you might see or get depending on who's counting. So data screening ensures that those results are hopefully interpretable. I mean, there's only so much we can do, right? You don't know what you don't know. You don't know what's missing sometimes. But to our best of our knowledge, this is accurate data that provides these results. And so I have kind of a list of things that you should check for. And these are in order. So accuracy first, missing data and outliers, which is what this video will cover, then assumptions of the statistical test. So notice that our assumption checks here, I cut this off, depends on the type of test because there are different tests and the different tests have different assumptions. But what we're going to do in this lecture series is give you kind of a complete guide for parametric st statistics that you can use on any type of statistical test, knowing that in R there are 1,000 different ways to do things. And so there are diagnostic tests often built into the statistical analysis. But I'm going to teach you just kind of like a one-stop procedure that would cover a lot of different things at once. So an important note, move me back down here. Okay. Normally we set alpha. Remember the alpha is our type one error. And this is the criterion we use to determine if we should reject the null hypothesis. Right? So we normally set this and we talk about this as p less than 0.05. There's no magic reason for 0.05. It's just one of these long-standing lines in the sand, if you will. But let's say we set alpha to 0.05. And okay? that's our type one error rate for the statistical test using null hypothesis testing. So we say, okay, P is less than 0.05, that would be statistically significant. In data screening, you really wanna use a more strict criterion because we don't wanna alter the data unless we know that something's wrong. And so we're gonna use alpha and set alpha to 0.001 to determine where there are problematic issues. So you're basically saying that this is really a problem because the likelihood of of this is very small, so it's really bad. Um, or the likelihood of the null given, you know, the, we reject the null, so this thing is more likely. So the likelihood of the null is very small. So this is real bad because we've set the criteria even stricter. So with null hypothesis testing, we're trying to balance alpha and beta, right? So um, finding the thing that's there, not making a mistake and saying it's there when it's not, versus missing it. And so 0.05 has all long been thought of as kind of this nice sweet spot for alpha. But with data screening, we just wanna make sure that we are more careful and use stricter criterion. And I'm using, I'm basing these kind of rules on the Tabachnik and Fidel. You'll see different people do different things. Like the Andy Field uses 0.05 as a criterion, which I think is way too, way too loose. Um, so this does differ from the book a little bit and I think as long as you get this idea that you can change these criterions, um, it's okay if you don't agree with me that it should be 0.01. Now for your homework, it should be 0.01. <laughs> but after that, it's up to you 
you should always justify the criterions that you're using. So what order should I do this in? Well, I've already told you this was in order, but we should start with accuracy checks, make sure the data is accurate, people haven't typed things that are outside the range of the values, the columns didn't get transposed, recode our factors, reverse code any items that need reverse coding. So instead of one to seven, they should be seven to one, that kind of thing. Followed by missing data. So dealing with the missing data, which might be simply excluding it or might be imputing it. Okay. Checking for outliers. And we'll mostly focus on multivariate outliers, but checking for people whose scores or data points whose scores are way outside the realm of the rest of the data. Then assumptions for whatever analysis we're using. But why this order? Okay. And so let me first do assumptions. Uh, assumptions include our additivity assumption. This is the assumption. We'll, we'll go through these one at a time in the next lecture. But the kind of briefly additivity is this, is the good thing, okay, where each variable that you have in an analysis adds something to the analysis. Sometimes the bad version of this is called multicollinearity. We don't want that. We do want our data to be normally distributed, but that's a tricky one. We'll come back to why that's tricky. Linearity because we're doing parametric assumptions using uh, linear math. Homogeneity and homoscedasticity, which are different forms of variance, equal variances. And we'll go through each of those in the next week's lectures. So right now we're gonna focus on one, two, three. But why this order? Coming back to that question. Well, if you correct an error, um, an inaccurate point, it may become missing data. So for example, we had a study where we asked people to rate things between zero and 100. Okay? And sometimes they added extra numbers. So it would come out as like 2000. Now, I don't know what that was supposed to be. It's not 200, that's still outside the realm of the data. It's not, do I know if it's two, if it's 20, or if they're just screwing around? And so often things like of that nature where a value is outside their possibilities of the data, become missing data. Well, if it becomes missing data, that becomes step two. Okay. So if we replace missing data, those points could then become outliers. Okay. And if they have missing data, they can't be analyzed in the outlier analysis that we're gonna use. Because how do you determine if it's an outlier if it's missing? Right. And then if I exclude outliers, that then changes my interpretation of the assumptions depending on the size of the data. So hopefully you're seeing that each step here potentially affects the next step. So the choice in the first step will affect the later steps. So we should do these in order to not have to keep backing up. And so the best way to learn this stuff is to just do it. So we're gonna work with an example data set that has um, the res resiliency 14 scale in it. Okay, this is a scale measuring resiliency. I, I tend to bounce back when bad things happen, that kind of stuff. And it's on uh, teenagers after a natural disaster. This is work with um, some friends of mine who do research on um, meaning and resiliency and post-traumatic growth after natural disasters. So we're going to have to pull out this one procedure that we can use on any type of analysis. And then as we go, you'll see us kind of change and update those procedures based on the analysis we're covering that particular week in class. So let's look at the structure of this data set real quick. So we've got gender or sex. So we're going to have to fix that. It probably should be factored. Okay, age, socioeconomic status. This is sort of a... a one to, I don't remember how high this goes actually, but it's kind of ordinal in the sense that people choose uh, an option. So zero to 50, 50 to 101 as parents' income. Uh, grade, what grade level they're in. And this is slightly made up data. So they're not all, they're not totally gonna match. Like here, I think we have like a 16, um, maybe one of these 16 points is listed as a seven. So that would be something we'd normally want to check for, but this is data that I kind of scrambled from my friends. So the grade level maybe just shouldn't be 
for the, you know, 18. It should be one through 12 in the US. Absences from class, and then their uh, resiliency scores. And this is a, a scale, you can Google it, resiliency 14. And then a health score. So they how they feel about their health okay, after this disaster. All right, from there, let's talk about accuracy. So accuracy is kind of just like, is the data what we expect the data to be? Now, this doesn't mean I want to, in terms of my hypothesis test, this just means like, I know the scale ranges from one to seven, are all the data points one to seven? Okay. And these are any factor variables that have been imported as numbers. We've already seen that we should fix those as part of our graphing uh, set of slides. Any reverse coded variables. So if you've given people a scale and the, the scale is listed as one to seven, but that question is negatively coded, um, you have to switch that, reverse it. The other issue that you can have, especially if you use survey platforms like Qualtrics, is every once in a while it loses his mind and codes them instead of one to seven, it codes them as like 10 to 18. <laughs> so you have to like put that in the right scale. Okay. Um, I, or there are scales that it codes as one to four, but the scale is really zero to three. So a lot of that you can pre-plan by fixing it in the survey platform. But if you've forgotten, this is the part where you could fix it. Any out of range or incorrect values. So any everything needs to be within the range of the data. And then other errors that may occur based on your data collection procedure. So if you ever have participants literally type anything instead of selecting an option, you will have to screen that a little bit more because they don't follow instructions or um, in a text analysis, this might be spell checking. So let's start with categorical variables. I find it easiest to break this into categorical and continuous because they tend to have different kind of procedures. And the first thing I wanna kind of look at here is the two that are coded um, as, as factors. Okay. Now, one thing I'm gonna do as we go throughout this, set, uh, this lecture is that I'm gonna change data set names with each step. So we've got this first accuracy step. Step I'm going to create a data set called no typos. Okay. And because we're working in R, we're you know we're never changing the original imported data unless we export it. But having different data sets for different steps allows me in my analysis to show how each step has affected my analysis. That's really more critical for outliers and for our accuracy checks if we do anything on those steps. So I could say, well, if we include outliers in our analysis, here's the results. If we exclude them, here's the results. And I have both of those data sets because I saved them separately. And this really isn't necessary in a sense, you could just keep overriding the master data set. But when you're performing an analysis, it's sometimes just easier to have them as different ones because then when a, review, a reviewer, for me as an academic person, but then when somebody says, well, you removed 200 participants, what happens if you don't? You don't have to kind of go back and recreate that data set separately. It was like, okay, let me just, here's my analysis. Let me change the name of the data I'm using. And you'll see that um, when we start running these as real analyses, um, but we'll save each step as a different data set. And that allows me to compare later to what I did in each step. So that being said, first thing I did was I just created a new data set called no typos. And that's the one we're going to edit instead of the master data set. All right. So I'm just going to look here. We're going to use apply that we used a couple weeks ago. I said, okay, up on my two categorical columns. Okay. Do this by column, one for rows, two for columns. Create me a table. Very cool, right? So now we're like really pulling in a lot of these different facets that we've covered in these different lectures to show you how they're used in the analysis. And so what it's done is it said, well, for sex, we have one, two, and three. That three is incorrect. We only allowed them to pick male and female. So I got to get rid of that three. And the socioeconomic status is one, two, and three. I think we just did it as low, middle, and high, or at least that's what I made up for this example. So those look okay. They just should be words, not numbers. 
So let's fix that stuff. So we can use factor, and I showed this in the last set of videos, that you can use factor to wipe out a number that doesn't exist as well. And so um, we could also exclude it in a different way, but this is easier. So I'm going to use factor here. Remember, the first uh, argument is the column of data that we want to work with. The levels here are 1 and 2, because that's what's in the data that we want to keep. So there's no three because we don't want to keep that one. We don't have a label for it. It's just incorrect. And the labels here are women and men. And I know this because, um, because I'm telling you that's what they are. <laughs> okay. Now for our socioeconomic status, we did the same thing, but the levels are one, two, three. And the labels here are low, medium, and high. Now I'm going to use the exact same table code. Again, just to make sure it's stuck. And it actually prints them as men and women, so it alphabetizes them. But if I back up, okay, I can see that those numbers match. 64 would be women because they're first. So it, it came through OK. And then low, medium, and high here um, because it's printing these out in alphabetical order. And so that's still, in, that's still correct. It's just um, shuffled them around. First problem solved. Next problem, continuous variables. Okay. So I can use that summary function to look at all of our summary statistics. We've talked about psych described as well, a couple of different ones, but let's, let's look at summary here because it's a base package and it makes it pretty easy. And this really is useful for allowing me to check the min and max values and reverse scoring. So for data that I know really well, I can see usually kind of easily if something hasn't been reverse scored. So for example, we use this scale, the meaning in life questionnaire a lot, and there's one reverse item on there. Almost all the other items have averages between five and six. So suddenly when that average is two, I know something's wrong. Okay. And so I'm like, oh, we forgot to reverse code that one because the average should be between five and six. So when we reverse it, that's what happens. So the RS scale runs from one to seven. So we clearly have some typos because I forced some typos in this data set. Now here, let's see. For um, sex and socioeconomic status, you can see that we got one missing value now. So one of our inaccurate data points became a missing score, which is why we do these in order. From age, we have 11 to 18, which is good because these are meant to be high school kids. For grade, we have one or one through 35, which is probably not accurate. Okay, especially not the one with the memory that I made some of this data up. <laughs> so we mostly probably just want to exclude some of these um, inaccurate values on the top end. <laughs> Absences, we have also one to 35, which is also incorrect. I don't remember if we if I fixed these. I think a fixed grade, but not absences. So let's just say that we know the grade one should not be that high. And we'll say there are some bad absences. Now, this is just because I kind of generated this data set and manipulated it. So we'd have some things to fix. In like, for example, our homework, I'll tell you what the values should be. But in your own data, you should know what the values to expect are. And then the other piece here is the resiliency scale. Now there are no reverse coded items on this, but I clearly added some typos here. So we've got some scores above um, seven and we don't have any below the min, but if, I'll show you how to fix it if you do. And our health score is a one to seven. So that one looks good. So we've got these issues. How do we fix them? If you have the original data somewhere, so let's say you had this in paper form for some reason, okay, um, and you had somebody type them in. If you have the paper form and you can figure out what the point should be, don't lose it. Go back, grab that paper form, and enter it. Okay. I feel like this happens less and less now with smartphones and digital technology. You know, we we mostly get data through some sort of computer-based system. Um, which have their own issues of, of 
not doing quite what you want, but you know, if, if you're out in the field, you may still be using paper <laughs> because it's easier, right? Um, so if you have the data, fix the data. Okay. If you don't have the data, delete that specific data point, not the entire participant. So if they've answered a whole bunch of items and they just happen to miss answer one of them by typing 2000 into their, to, to their point instead of one through 100, I don't want to delete the whole participant, right? I, I would lose all of their data. So instead I would just um, make that one inaccurate data point in, missing okay? or fix it if I have it. But generally we don't, they're just, we don't know why they're wrong, they're just wrong. And so that allows us to keep, sorry, the entire data set um, rather than like pretending that the whole person's wrong when it's just that one point is wrong. And we'll talk about how to deal with, is the whole person worth keeping in a second. All right, so to do that, if you have it in one or two columns, it's simplest to work one column at a time, or if the columns all have different rules, you kind of have to do this one at a time. Okay. So for this example, um, we know that students couldn't have missed more than 15 days, and then I actually edited grade. So let's just update the notes right now and fix both of these. So I'm gonna come back over here and we'll just do both of them. Whoops, that's missing data, too far. Here we are. So we know that students couldn't have missed more than 15 days and they cannot be more than uh, 12 for grade. So the first thing I might do is run the summary on grade. Oops, first thing I'd do is run the whole data set. There we go. And we can see that it runs from one to 35. Well, that's going that right. And I know they can't be bigger than 12. And so let's see. I'm going to take and erase everything. We'll talk about how I came up with that number and just how that code in just a second. And now you see I have from one to 11. Okay, there was clearly no 12s and I got one in A. So we're, we're getting rid of that 35. That's clearly wrong. Now, how do I come up with this? Okay, let's do this for absences. So I might run a summary of absences first, even though I've already seen it doesn't hurt to look at it again. And I happen to know they couldn't have had more than 15 absences. So I want to start by picking that particular column. So our no typos data set, absences, and do square brackets. Okay. Remember that those square brackets are um, where we start subsetting. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna find everyone who's something. Okay. Well, you could type one one to 14, right? Now we get the first 14 scores, but we're wanting specifically here to find people who meet some logical criterion. And we actually cover this in the very first week's lecture, but it's been a little while. So remember that logical criterions are questions. So I wanna know anybody whose absence score is greater than 15. Okay. And the spaces aren't necessary, it's just easier to read. <laughs> So remember when you do this sort of thing, it creates this um, Boolean option or a logical, right? So it's true, false. And there is one true in here, here it is visually. And so um, if I run that within the square brackets, it only grabs the trues. So it finds that one data point that's inaccurate. And now I can set that to NA. And let's make sure that did what I expected it to. Anybody? No typos. There we go. Absences. And now we have from one to seven and the there's that one in a value. So now we fixed both of them. All right. Now, when I have inaccurate values for a set of columns, so let's, all of the resiliency scale questions have the same rule. This becomes a little bit easier, but the code looks a little bit crazier. Okay. So we can use that kind of subsetting logical set of operators to fix all of the columns at once. Okay. And so I 
use the names option here. You can also use call names. Call names and names in a data frame tend to return the same object. And names is a bit easier and faster to type because <laughs> it's not as long. But these are the column names in our data frame. And so I can count two, three, four, five, six through 19 are the columns that I'm interested in. And I just want to prove that that's what I'm doing. This is just me checking that I'm grabbing the right columns. So no typo, six through 19. As you get better at this, there are a lot of ways to do this. And what I actually do now is use some regular expressions. So I say, okay, find me every column that has this pattern, RS number. But that's a little outside the scope of this lecture. So we'll just say um, six to 19, because that's the columns we're interested in. So I know I'm grabbing the right ones. Remember the head function just prints out the first six rows. So you can also use the view function if you're working within our markdown, but don't in your markdown documents, don't include a view um, uh, in the code blocks because it will be unhappy with you. All right. So now I know I want all of these columns. Okay, so I'm gonna take the no typos data set and I want columns six through 19. So remember there's a blank here in front of the rows. And then we're gonna use that same idea, another set of square brackets. And so this is basically the same set of rules as the one column. We say, okay, I want all of these columns, another set of square brackets. Here's the rule I'm looking for. Okay. This ends up treating all of these columns sort of like um, one giant, giant row. So let's look at how this prints out. Because I didn't do that because it looks crazy <laughs> when you print it out. And so it looks for all of the points um, that, sorry, let's look at just this part. Okay. So on our no typos data set, these, all these columns, let's find all the ones that are greater than seven. So that's why I say kind of treats it like in this giant format, right? So for each one, it, it returns true or false or NA because that's a missing value and it doesn't know how to um, evaluate a missing value. And so by using this kind of stacked code here, let me scroll back up here. So on these columns, look for this rule we can find all of our NA values and all of our inaccurate values. So here's a 10 and a 15. Okay. And one thing I like about this is that it matches kind of uh, how we treated this a minute ago, right? We just did one column before, but now we're doing multiples. Okay. So we're gonna set all of those to NA all at once. We don't have to do one column at a time because if you have 200 columns that you need to do this on, that's a lot of work if it's one column at a time. Let's create a summary one more time, make sure that all of our max values are within range. Okay. And uh, this one didn't get fixed because we just added absences, but if we reran these notes, those would be fixed okay. and they all look pretty good. Okay. So that's the end of our accuracy section. Oh, I lied to you. One more thing on accuracy. <laughs> It's like 15, not 13. So the other thing that we can do, and this really helps for reverse coded items and things that just are like, what is wrong with that? And I'll give you a good example in a second. So we can use our mean and standard deviation for continuous variables to think about if there's something that has gone really wrong. And so you just wanna make sure it's the data you expect. And a mean is a good way to make that judgment. And the standard deviation tells me the spread of that data. So both very useful and very large spreads can indicate maybe something numerically is weird. Like why is that so much larger than normal? Why, you know, on, on a one to seven scale, why is it four? That seems really wild, what's happening? And then no variance can also be very bad for you. So this depends on the scale of the data too. So you always have to keep in mind that if you're talking about income, standard deviation is very high. But if we're talking about our Likert scales from one to seven, standard deviation tends to be between one and two points. 
So again, I can do, okay, let's use that names function again, just to remind myself which columns are the categorical ones. So that's one and three. And so I'm gonna use my apply function to calculate the mean. And we've kind of been doing this already. So use apply based on all columns, give me the mean. And I do have to tell it to remove an A's because I know I have an A values. So this will calculate the mean on every single column except one and three, hence the minus, and give me the mean. Okay. So the mean age is 15. This makes sense in teenage data set, even with some values. <laughs> and it says the mean grade is six. That's how you can tell it's made up. Average uh, absences. And then all of our resiliency items, notice here, are between four and a little over five. And that's a normal for that scale. Okay. So one to seven between four and five, slight skew, looks great. Okay. And then our health variable is hovering right in the middle. Now, if I wanted to do the same thing, but look at standard deviation, I just switch from mean to standard deviation. Okay, and all of these are pretty, pretty similar. Okay. And so this looks pretty good. Okay. Now, an example of a time where it didn't look very good. So I was working with a student where we were checking multiple choice data and now multiple choice data gets scored as correct or incorrect, right? You either get the answer right or you get the answer wrong. And we were looking through it and I was like, why is our analysis not running? I was like, can you show me the like accuracy part of this? So she scrolled back up and we reran the standard deviations and somehow the data set, I think when they applied the coding, they converted ABCD to the correct and incorrect scoring had scored everyone at getting every item wrong. And so the data set in one section was just all zeros. And I was like, I don't think that's right. <laughs> These were easy questions. Why are people getting this 100% wrong? And she was like, oh. So the standard deviation on those variables was not quite zero, but very close to zero. Because what had happened is when we re -import, we imported the second half of the data. So we ran, ran one semester and ran it again another semester. That second semester ended up getting coded. Everyone got coded as incorrect. And so it made our, our variance almost zero. So it was hard to see at first because the standard deviation was not literally zero. But once we compare, once we realize our analysis was acting oddly, that was the spot where we could back up to and go, oh, okay, the data is incorrect. Okay, so garbage in, garbage out. And that is the summary of our accuracy section. We're gonna break this into three videos to cover each kind of piece separately, each step separately. So part one done. The next section we'll move on to is missing data. So head on over to that one.